And well, this morning, we are in part, what, five, six, six, five, I think six, six, part six of things that will get you canceled and why they matter. And this morning, uh, the title of the class is probably the one most likely to get us kicked off of the various online platforms to which we tend to send uh, these videos. Like YouTube, I'm pretty sure if more than 100 people watch this video, that they will eventually flag us probably as some sort of nefarious organization. They'll probably call us, you know, something, I don't know, one of their favorite terms like uh, we're, a, we're a subversive group or, you know, that kind of thing. We're a hate group. Um, I remember early in the history of the church, not, not me, but another of the pastors, said something just boringly orthodox about sexuality regarding homosexuality and uh, put it on YouTube. Some people got a hold of it, and it, it, this was like 10 years ago. So we got a couple, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 views on it, which was a lot for us at that point. And uh, it, it wasn't long before somehow they found this pastor's address. They were sending him... I mean, packets of information with threats and, you know, breathing threats and murder against him for his violation of their blasphemy laws. Uh, the title today, the, the thing that will get you canceled, but that matters nonetheless and which we should still insist on, is calling things gay and otherwise violating the pagan blasphemy laws. Calling things gay and otherwise violating the pagan laws blasphemy laws. And it's probably appropriate for me to begin with a word on the title. Uh, <laughs> since, since as you hear that, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, we uphold a Christian sexual ethic which involves, you know, certain doctrinal conclusions about homosexual sexual activity and that sort of thing. And so, yes, you know, we're with you on that, but this seems to be just a little bit, you know, you know, this seems to be a little bit aggressive. This seems to be a little bit kind of uh, poking the gods of the age in the eye, in both eyes, as we've been saying. So I, I want to explain what I mean by it and what we will be discussing today, because I'm not actually going to spend 45 minutes just trying to get you to look at things that the Bible would say are malachia, are soft or effeminate or uh, sinfully... Um, contrary to the creational design for masculinity and femininity and say something like, that's gay. <laughs> and mean it as an insult, to mean like, hey, the, the rainbow flag flying across the street at the Eccles Art Center, you know, that every year they have to add a new color for a new sexual perversion that we invent, or a new, they're running out of room. I mean, the thing's gonna be like a country mile square by the time they're done figuring out all of the various perversions that we can come up with with respect to human sexuality, you know, to look at something like that and say, that is gay. And, and, and not mean it as a compliment. You know, to mean it as, uh, uh, gross. To mean it as something like, ugh. Like, ugh, that is, mm, get that out of here. What I'm trying to do is actually just with the title give you a representative example of the kind of thing that we're talking about today, the kind of thing I'm gonna try to talk you into either um, having the skill to do yourself or when you see it, to understand what is going on, and that is the issue of godly mockery, of um, Christian satire, of um, Christian skewering rhetorically of wickedness in whatever shape that, it might, that you might find it out there in the world. And this class, therefore, has everything to do with something we've been talking about quite a bit, which is blasphemy laws. Blasphemy laws. Now, a blasphemy law is a law against taking God's name in vain. And as such, it is a good law. We ought not take the Lord's name in vain. See Exodus. See the Ten Commandments. We ought not take the Lord's name in vain. In vain. We ought not to swear falsely on the name of the Lord. We ought not to flippantly or casually use the Lord's name in a jocular manner. We ought not use the Lord's name as a kind of curse, as you will hear all over the place. And even in, our, in my own vocabulary and the vocabulary of, of my family, you know, we're trying to fight against even the minced oaths that have found their way into our language where we substitute a similar word for the name of God and we say, oh, you know, OMG, I didn't mean God, I meant gosh, right? 
So it's difficult because this is, blasphemy is pervasive in our culture. But in our culture, you can commit blasphemy quite freely, the real kind of blasphemy, quite freely. No one will bat an eye. You can publish it in a, a newspaper article. You could publish it to the internet. You could put it on a video. You could, put, you could hear blasphemy in a movie, in a book. And no, it, even many of us would probably you know, barely even notice because we're so desensitized to blasphemy. Blasphemy is an evil thing, true blasphemy. Think, think of something like Psalm 139 that in the metrical version, the singing version, it puts the end of the psalm like this. It says, oh, David's saying, O oh, men of blood, from me depart. Oh, that you would the wicked slay. They speak of you with ill intent and take your holy name in vain. Do I not hate your haters, Lord? Those loathing you I have abhorred. I hate them with a perfect hate. I count them as my enemies. That was David's attitude to people who blasphemed the name of his God. And by the way, that's inspired by the Holy Spirit inerrant. And we're actually commanded to sing these songs. This is one of the songs we're commanded by the Lord to sing when Paul says sing to one another in Psalms. The sound of true blasphemy should be to our ears like the sound of jarring, discordant screeching. Right? But like all demonic perversions, idols establish their own perverted inversions of the true laws that God sets, right? And so actually, you know, take something like Christian modesty now becomes a vice instead of a virtue, and you become prudish. And uh, sexual licentiousness in dress becomes a virtue. It's empowering. You know, oh, you go, girl. How much can you show? Wow, she's so comfortable in her own skin. Look how confident she is. Like, uh, idols establish their own negative images of the law of God, and then they seek to enforce that negative image with the same verve that Christians ought to be concerned with the true law, and they've done this as well with blasphemy. They require, the false gods require, that men reverence their names and their values. And so you will know that you violated a pagan blasphemy law when you say something that apparently sounds to the world like jarring, discordant screeching about their gods. For example, if you were to be walking past the Eccles Art Center on a Tuesday morning and you beheld in your peripheral vision the flapping of a colorful flag and you said something like, with a tone of disgust, that is gay. And someone overheard you, they would probably They'd be in a, a small huff, maybe a large huff. They might follow you. They might write down your license plate number and report you to the authorities. And, and particularly, you know, go to the UK. This is absolutely on the books in the UK that you could not stand up, for example, and teach Romans 1 without being in danger of being arrested under the guise of what law? Hate speech laws. Hate speech laws are just blasphemy laws. That's all they are. They're blasphemy laws. Call me by my preferred pronouns, which are a lie, or you will be guilty of a hate speech violation on this campus. You know, there was something just this week at Weber State that cracked me up, and I don't know the intentions of the people who did this. They may be, you know, bad intentions, but somebody put up some, like, jocular signs around campus secretly in the night while in masks that said simply, it's okay to be white. Okay, in response to that sentence, which, by the way, is it okay to be white? I really hope so, because otherwise I need to make some calls. <laughs> you know, like, oh, oh no, oh no, oh no. It's okay to be black, it's okay to be brown, it's okay to be white, it's okay to be you know, slightly reddish like some of my uh, Chippewa ancestors, it's okay to be a gloriously tan masculine Frenchman. Just saying, I'm just kidding about that one. There is absolutely an uproar on campus. It, this made the news. They have increased police patrols at Weber State this week. Why? Because someone put up a little print, you know, home-brewed sign that said it's okay to be white. The, 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 the black students on campus, some of them, are holding sit-ins in protest in whatever hall, in the commons, at Weber State this week. That's a blasphemy law, what you just, that dynamic. That's a blasphemy law. So like, uh, like all demonic perversions, they're going to invert, they're going to say, reverence my name, they're going to say, treat my ethics as if they are good 
and true and beautiful, and God-fearing Christians ought to see what's going on in those laws, and with precision, and with care, and with restraint, and with wisdom, and with humility, and with biblically informed kindness, absolutely roast that nonsense in godly mockery sometime. And I don't mean all Christians all times, but I do mean that sometimes the Lord absolutely does call his people, particularly teachers of his word, to take prophetic stance, stands against the gods of the age and to stand up and draw a lot of fire. And some of that fire will come from Christians who believe that they're being unkind as they make fun of, in a godly way, mock, pull out what, you know, Douglas Wilson calls the serrated edge, satiric voice, and roast the gods of the age. And this is actually a part of our evangelism, we'll see. This is a part of our discipleship. This is a part of our witness publicly in the world, that the Lord is God and that he sits in the heavens and laughs at all of the lesser make-believe pretend gods. And so in this class, I intend to speak a word or two in praise of godly bullying, righteous satire, and generally making fun of demon gods in Jesus' name. And there are really three lines of reasoning that I'd like to follow this morning on why we need to keep some of these sharper rhetorical tools on our rhetorical tool belt. So, so, so sometimes we're going to be extraordinarily winsome, like, you know, see Paul at the Areopagus in Acts 17, Mars Hill. He went, and Paul was extremely patient with the philosophers there. He was extremely bold, but he was also quite patient. Paul did not stand up and actually make fun of their pantheon of gods, though it would be, there's a lot of available puns to make regarding the Greek and Roman gods. They're pretty funny. They're ridiculous, quite frankly. He was quite winsome. Obviously, that's something you should do. The same Paul dealt with other opponents and told them that he wished that those who would say that Christians must be circumcised to obey the law would go the whole way and cut the whole thing off. That's a verse in the Bible. The same Paul that said that was winsome in Acts 17. Apparently, we need to have range. Apparently, we need to have range. Apparently, we need to have some sharp tools on our belt. We need to have some boxing gloves, you know, in our backpack. And we also need to understand how to be reasonable, patient, kind, and let our reasonableness be know, known to all men. And none of the verses calling for kindness, biblical kindness, are at war with the biblical examples that we'll see of godly mockery that might sound unkind to the untrained ear. So the first line of reasoning why I would say this kind of thing and encourage you to either be able to recognize it in wisdom when you see it from leaders like the pastors at this church or godly men outside of this church, or occasionally you may be you know, you may require this tool on your belt and, and need to know how to handle it. The first line of reasoning I've given support of this claim is that the scriptures are incomprehensible if sarcasm, mockery, bullying, satiric edge, and the like are inherently sinful. And by that, I mean that in their essence, they're sinful. There is no non-sinful way to deploy these things. People often assume that the one employing godly mockery and the satiric voice and that kind of thing are the ones who need to justify themselves. Like, whoa, buddy, show me where it says you can talk like that in the Bible. And if we're deploying it with wisdom, we ought to say cheerfully, no problem, but before I do, can you show me where in the Bible you justify only using words with round edges and pillowy softness because there's a lot less of that in the Bible than there is the kind of thing that I'm engaged in, believe it or not. Meaning that if we're just going by volume, the scriptures, particularly the prophets, the apostles, and the Lord, deploy something that has at least some kind of edge to it more frequently than they do what we might consider very reasonable, patient, kind, loving, gentle speech by volume. The thing you need to know about a sword is that it cuts. Duh. I mean, right? The scriptures are a sword, the sword of the spirit. And, and what do we see in Hebrews right after we're told that the scriptures are a sharp two-edged sword? Well, that they cut. They cut to the division of joints and marrow, soul and spirit. The scriptures are a sword, and so they cut. Uh, a sharp 
pointy, slicey, dicey sword. That's what the Word of God is. And so if you're just going to read it out loud, sometimes you're going to be engaged in something like godly mockery because the Scriptures are aimed at shutting the mouths of fools and blasphemers even as they are also concerned with calling those fools and blasphemers to life and joy and peace and repentance and faith in the God whom their lives are lived in high rebellion against. So here are some examples in Scripture. You look through the ministry of Jesus, Paul. There are so many that that I'm just going to give you a handful, and I'm going to continue talking really fast. So uh, Jesus answered them, "'Many good works have I shown you from my Father.'" For which of those works do you stone me? John 10, 32. Jesus has just healed a man, and they are in the process of an engagement, and this leper whom he's healed is now cleansed, and on this particular case, they seek, the Pharisees, his opponents, pick up stones and seek to put him to death. And so Jesus, and you kind of have to get out of your normal reading of the voice of Jesus, which tends to make him kind of like you know, never funny, never sharp, never sarcastic. This is sarcasm. I have done, I've, done, I've done a lot of good works. Which one of those good works are you uh, seeking the death penalty on the basis of today, gentlemen? <laughs> Jesus did not cower. He didn't run. He wasn't like, oh, no, they got the rock. Come on, boys, let's go. He was like, hey, um, uh, is it for healing the guy here or healing the blind man last week? Which of those do you just, teachers of the law, wish to enact the death penalty on the basis of. You know, uh, I'm sorry, for, for my repentance, would you maybe like me, I don't know, to do the kind of things that you guys do and rob widows? Would that make me more popular with you? Would you like me to devour widows' houses instead, like you guys? You know, is, is that the path to acceptance before this particular court? This is just a, a small, little, mild jab. Another one that in There's a book on this subject called A Serrated Edge, A Brief Defense of Biblical Satire and Trinitarian Skylarking, which based on the title, of course, you know, is by Douglas Wilson. Uh, He he gives many examples. Another one he points to in Luke 13, 33 is when Jesus uh, (laughs) says, Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Jesus is on his, you know, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's saying, I need to hurry to Jerusalem because they're about to kill me. And it wouldn't be fitting for a prophet of Israel to be killed by anybody other than Israel in the capital city of Israel. <laughs> like, it's, this is funny. He, he, he's making fun of them. He's saying, how ridiculous is it that the people who kill the prophets are not the pagans? It's not the Assyrians. It's not the Romans. It's not the Babylonians. It's the Jews. The Jewish prophets, in almost every case, are killed by who? The Jewish people. So Jesus is saying, look, if I'm going to die, if someone's going to kill me, I better get to Jerusalem. Because <laughs> that's the place where prophets are put <laughs> to death. Okay, that's just mild. Jesus' harshest polemic, it, rhetorical exaggeration, absurd wordplay, serrated speech, was obviously reserved for the Pharisee. And time would fail for us to consider all of them. But just go read Matthew 23, just at some point in your life. And you will see all the things he calls them. Or, or read the Gospel of John, and where Jesus says, I'm paraphrasing, your father is the devil to the Pharisees. They're making some, you know, snide remarks about his parentage. Oh, you were born of a virgin, were you, Jesus? Who's your father? And he says, I know my father, but you know, I also know yours, the devil, Satan. Like, can you imagine going up to somebody and saying, uh, getting in, a, in an altercation with them where they're like, oh, you Christian, man. Like, you don't, you, you know, oh, you got a father in heaven? And I'd be like, I know my father. How about yours? His name is Satan. Wouldn't be very winsome, right? People would probably be like, hey, hold him back, man. He's not evangelizing anymore. He's gotten in some verbal fisticuffs. We need to get him, we need to get him back. He, he said that they were like tombs with rotting corpses in them, but luckily real pretty ones with a fresh coat of paint on the outside. Uh, He he said that they love to exaggerate their holiness with broad phylacteries and other accoutrements on their garments. Uh, They they, they loved to, uh, you know, they were like blind people leading blind people to fall in a hole. Which I know we're like, it's the Bible. It's very vaunted. It is. It's absolutely, we need to revere it. And yet, that's funny. That's funny. Picture a blind person yelling out, Hey, any other blind people, come take my hand. I'll lead you. 
and promptly falling into a hole. I mean, in our day and age, maybe that wouldn't be considered funny because comedy is dead, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> it's just a little bit funny. The one taking the hand of the blind leader is a, is a fool because why are you following this blind guy? He doesn't like, get on the 747. The pilot has, what's his vision? Well, uh, you know, 2,400. He forgot his glasses. That's fine. I'll get on the plane. And the, the guide is obviously a fool, too. This, this also, side note, proves an important point about the use of godly mockery, which is that it tends to involve generalization. Generalization. Um, Paul, at one point, says to Titus, uh, he's talking about the evangelism of the island of Crete, which is about 100 miles long, and he's saying, essentially, um, you know, Titus, go set up churches like this. This is how we're going to make Crete a Christian island. Let's do that. And he says, though, about the Cretans, he says, you know, their, their own poet has said it correctly, that Cretans are always liars, lazy, evil beasts, and gluttons. And he just says it about all of the Cretans, Paul does. He's like, this is true. <laughs> you're like, what? Because right after that, Paul says, okay, and now, Titus, when you're going, find elders among these Cretans that are godly and a husband of one wife, and they're not addicted to much wine, and they are of good repute. And you're like, wait, I thought you said all the Cretans were lazy beasts and gluttonous liars. So where are we going to find these qualified elders? Well, it's generalization. Jesus does the same thing. Were all of the Pharisees actually hypocrites? Actually, no. By the end, we see Pharisees saved. We see Pharisees who actually oppose, though they do so in a cowardly way many times, but eventually are emboldened and get, you know, some of them lose their lives if we read church history. The Pharisees. Not all the Pharisees were blind guides. But Jesus says to the Pharisees, woe to you blind guides. What's he doing? Generalization. The first way that the satirist will be attacked is to say, well, not every case is, tr of, is true of what you just said. Not every case. Let's say you make fun of churches with lady pastors. And you say, like, there are a bunch of cowardly men in those churches. They need to stand up and tell that, pa that, that lady, you're not qualified to be an elder. Sit down. Go home. Like Johnny Mack got in big trouble for <laughs> recently concerning Beth Moore. Well, not every man in a church with a woman pastor is actually a coward. Some of them just don't know any better. Some of them are new Christians, new converts. Right? But that generalization would still stand on principle. And it would be justified on the basis of these examples. The Old Testament is a veritable cornucopia of rhetoric you could cut yourself on. Go read Ezekiel 23. It is actually too inappropriate for this class. And you're like, what? This class? I know. This is, this is the only chapter in the Bible that when Chuck Smith, the Calvary Chapel pastor, he preached through every chapter of the Bible every four years in their evening service. Yeah, three or four chapters at a time every week. He skipped this chapter, only chapter of the Bible. He was wrong to do so, I think, you know. Lord bless him. I think he was wrong to do so. It's, it's God-breathed and profitable. But he skipped it because just reading it out loud will make older ladies blush. And, young, you know, hopefully younger ladies. They're, they're inoculated by rap music and whatnot to the kind of language that you might find in Ezekiel 23. But this is thus saith the Lord's speech. He's actually mocking and condemning and declaring woes upon Israel for their spiritual adultery. And he does so in graphic sexual language. Amos 6 is another example where the prophet Amos employs satire all the time. He, he talks about how the, the Israelites at this time lazed about the wealthy in ease and wealth. They drank their chilled line, wines as they selected the next lotion with which they would slather their fat bodies with. And they were doing so on the backs of their oppressed brothers whom they had sinned against. Their Jewish brothers and sisters. They were neglecting the affliction of God's people. And they... God's people. And so the prophet says things like, you fat cows. The prophet, thus saith the Lord, you fat cows. And he's talking about the ladies. You're like, Amos, Amos, didn't you go to seminary? <laughs> Don't you know? Elijah and the prophets of Baal is the classic example. Maybe your God's on the toilet. Cry harder. <laughs> Hey, maybe you didn't cut yourselves deep enough. You know, they're dancing around trying to get Baal to do something. Baal, do something. You know, and there's the meme that I'm not going to, never mind, never mind. It's even too far for this class. You know, but, but, but Elijah, 
<laughs> Elijah, what are you doing? And then at the end of the story, after he's like, oh, and Lord God, you're the true God, can you show it? Uh, and he makes them like get the altar a lot wetter, make it harder for it to be consumed. And God just fallujas the, <laughs> the rocks and just burns them up. Like the rocks are consumed by the fire. And then he's like, yeah, slaughter all these guys. Take them down by the river and cut their heads off. The prophet Elijah in the Bible. A just man, a godly man. Think about the Proverbs talk about lazy people. He's like a door that turns over. He, you know, he turns over in his bed like a door on its hinge. He's just so lazy that he's just sighs from one side to the other. Oh, and then he says, I can't go outside today. There could be lions in the street. I can't go to work. You know, if you've ever been a manager in the food service industry, you've received some of these uh, calls before. That I, couldn't, I, could not, I couldn't make it to work today. It was too cold. You know you live in Utah, right? Couldn't risk it. Could be ice on the road. You know there's ice on the road for four months of the year. I'm, you know what? I'm sorry. I feel like you're being disrespectful right now, but consider this my two weeks' notice. Uh, these skewers, lazy people, or pretty girls without sense, like gold, like a golden ring in a pig's snout, even so is a pretty woman without discretion. Proverbs 11:22 paraphrased. That's the Bible, guys. That's the Bible. When you see a ditzy blonde, again, generalizations, I'm sorry if you're blonde, my wife is blonde, I love blondes, they're very smart blondes. But when you see a ditzy blonde and someone just goes, you know, it's like a gold ring in a pig's snout, you're being biblical. You're just being biblical. You're just reading Proverbs 11:22 out loud. A foolish woman without sense, she's kind of like a big old hog with a ring in her nose. It's not really becoming, right? Some of you are obviously uncomfortable. Remember, this is just the Bible, okay? Now, you might hear a certain kind of response to, the, to this sort of thing, <laughs> you know, if you attempt to do it. And again, we're gonna get to like using care with this. Like this is, this is, uh, a, a, this is the equivalent of an AR-15, rhetorically speaking. Use it with care, okay? Use it with care. You don't pull it out at, you know, every family gathering around the Thanksgiving table when your non-Christian uncle, you know, says something heretical. You don't all of a sudden blast him with your satire cannon and, and, and basically ruin your witness forever, okay? I'm not saying that. But sometimes you'll hear people say, um, like, okay, yeah, that's true, but you're not Jesus, man. Don't know if you noticed this. You're not Elijah. Where are the prophets of Baal, Elijah? Where are the prophets of Baal? And they'll, they'll be quite concerned with your sanity that you seem to have confused yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't talk like he did to the Pharisees. You're not him. Okay, I know, but I, you respond, I know, but I'm trying to be more like him. Isn't that the whole, aren't you? Isn't that the whole point? I'm trying to talk like him, walk like him, act like him, love like him, hate like him, speak like him, roast the pagans like him, uh, love the lost like him, you know, throw down strongholds like him, love my enemies like him. I'm trying to have range, man. I'm trying to be like these guys. What's the point of Hebrews 11, the great hall of faith, if it's not, so go therefore and do likewise. In faith, be like these men. In faith, follow the Lord. And, and one of the things that's going to be on the table if you follow the Lord is the occasional use of godly mockery and maybe even whipping people. Don't actually do that. Well, ask first. Okay, second reason is because nice words about damnable things isn't nice at all. You, you, you can't just say, I used a nice word. And, and that's not enough information for me to tell you whether you're godly or not. You know, speak is a transitive verb. You have to tell me the object of what you have spoken about and how you've spoken about it before I can tell you whether you're righteous or not. If you say, well, I was very nice to the demon, that's actually sinful, right? What was the great sin that Isaiah pointed out about the people? Woe to you who call evil good and good evil. Woe to you who make black white and white black. You're evil because you don't know how to use words. You keep using good words for bad things and bad words for good things. This is evil. This is what you're hearing when people talk about the evil of privilege, by the way, when people say, well, that man was born with privilege. His parents loved him. They took him to church every week. They left him inheritance. They taught him how to use his money. He's wise. Obviously, all of that privilege needs to be repented of. And you'd say, you're calling white black. You're calling evil good. What you call privilege, I call blessing and wisdom. You ought to thank God for that, not repent of it. 
Evil good, good evil. This is the inversion of language. And so our culture has no idea. It's like Nineveh. They didn't know their left hand from their right hand. Our culture has no idea what's good. And so they call really bad things good. And they have no idea what's bad, and so they call really good things bad. And sometimes, very occasionally, you're going to need to even have a swear word in your vocabulary, like Paul did when he talked about the Judaizers and their trust in their works. At the, at the, most, you know, at the most tame, Paul said that all of that kind of teaching was poop, at the most tame. But an argument can be made that he was, he was using a very strong word, scubalon. It was, it was poop. It was dung. Like when Isaiah says that all of our righteous deeds, our filthy rags, are menstrual rags. It's literally what he's saying in context. Okay, sometimes you're going to need to use bad words to talk about bad things. And Christians with a tender conscience might say, hey, stop using bad words and not understanding the context. Stop insulting people and things. Well, you need to understand how to insult people and things the way that the Lord Jesus did and the way that Paul did. And finally, I would say that we need this kind of thing in our tool belt because one of the most common of those black evils in the world that we need black words for is human arrogance. And one of the surest remedies to human arrogance is mockery. People are tremendously proud. Uh, the root of sin, you could say, in a sense, is pride. It's to exalt yourself above God so that you own the dictionary. You get to determine what is good and evil. You get to say what God said, did not God say, don't touch the tree. Well, he actually didn't, but I'm going to pretend like he did. I'm, I'm appointing myself God. I'm judging God. I'm making my own laws. I'm going my own way. I'm, I'm living autonomously from his law. I'm trying to be my own ruler. Pride. And the thing about pride is that it can look very firm and big, but it looks very firm and big in the way that a really blown up balloon is firm and big. Like, there it is. It's quite large. And, and, and if you painted it like a rock, people might, you know, mistake it for something solid. But one little pinprick, and that thing explodes. That's human pride. That's human arrogance. Proud people are like big puffed up balloons, and one little prick can deflate the whole thing can absolutely reveal the ridiculousness of a proud human being. Because human beings have nothing to be proud of autonomously from God. We have only things to be ashamed of autonomously from God. And so what you see over and over and over when godly mockery is used in the Bible is that it's deployed against the most arrogant of people. This is one of the ways you know how to use it. Am I talking with a humble person who is broken in their sin? And they need healing. A quenched, you know, a, a smoldering flax he will not quench. A bruised reed he will not break. The Lord Jesus is very tender with those who are weak and know it. Very tender. Very tender. It's those who are lifted up in arrogance who get the sharpest knock. Why? Because while they're like a, a big full balloon, they're also like a brittle bone. Pride is a brittle bone, easily broken. One sharp knock can snap it. And being snapped in half, if you're a brittle bone in arrogance, raised up against the knowledge of God, is a grace. It's a grace. It's, you think you're God, Pharaoh? You think you're descended from the sun God raw on your dad's side, twice removed? Let me show you who the real God is. How about some darkness and boils and death in livestock disease, and grasshoppers covering the land, and a river turned to blood. Let's see who the real God is, Pharaoh. Go ahead, do God stuff. Or, I thought you were a God. Do some God stuff, Pharaoh. Cosmic war. God, God absolutely mocks those, holds them in derision, who think that they are God. Think of the Tower of Babel, the highest of towers, man's humanistic ascent to the heavens, God looks at it, and in Genesis it says, he says to himself, come, let us go down and take a look, which is one of the most subtle. This is called Horatian satire. It's a very subtle satire as opposed to juvenilian satire, which is just like skylarking and obvious, and like the onion is often juvenilian satire. Horatian satire is kind of British. It's a little more subdued. It's a little more G.K. Chesterton than it is, you know, like comedy, uh, like what's it, the Saturday Night Live kind of satire. You know, this is Horatian satire where Jesus says, or, or where, where, where the God has Let's go down and take a look at their really tall tower that they have to look up at. Come, let us go down and look at it. What are they trying to do? 
they're trying to build a big tower to be, you know, on par with the heavens. They're trying to get up in the heavens and say, look at us. And God says, where is it? I can't see it. Is it? Nope. Sorry, that's a mountain. I made that. That's bigger. Um, <laughs> oh, there it is. There's Babel. And then he just sends a flood. You know, I mean, this is right after he sent a flood and they make a big waterproof tower. They cover it in tar and bitumen. They're like, I know what we'll do. If God sends any more floods, we'll make a big waterproof tower. And God then he's like, hey, uh, you speak Arabic, you speak Chinese. Good luck. It's the most hilarious story in Genesis, in my opinion. So human arrogance just absolutely invites you know, where's your big tower? See, if I stoop real low, maybe I can get it. So uh, this tells us some proper aims for these kinds of words. Uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about protecting the sheep on the one hand with godly mockery because uh, the, 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 the vaunted wisdom of the day, when the culture is ascendant, when the church is not the dominant culture, so like unlike, say, the Middle Ages or unlike, uh, say, uh, the, the early American colonies, which were overtly Protestant and Christian, Huguenots, uh, Puritans, it was overtly Christian. Uh, when, when the culture like ours is not overtly Christian, the dominant culture can begin to set the narrative like that Overton window that we talked about, where they can begin to start subtly influencing how we think about things until we're like, yeah, you know what? Homosexuality is beautiful. I, I know it's sinful, but it can be really beautiful. I've seen, you know, I've seen some, um, some sitcoms designed for 40-year-old ladies. I've seen some and you know, they've always got the gay couple, and they're so sweet. They're so nice. They're way nicer than that hetero uh, couple over there, right? We, th this happens to us. We get discipled by the culture. We get catechized by the culture. And what godly satire does is it comes in, and it just raises it all to the ground. When you read a good satiric article by a wise Christian about something that maybe you've been in danger of wanting to be cool enough to be accepted by that clique concerning— it comes in and it just shows how stupid it is. How utterly stupid the whole, the whole thing is. You know, we've talked about evolution as a good example where they're like, you're telling me that you're, you, you're, you're great, 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 great. You know, there are a lot of greats, but your great, great granddaddy is a rock and you want me to listen to you. That's funny. That's really funny. You think that you're just an animal. You think that you're basically a slightly more evolved monkey and you want me to listen to you about the history of the world. Sir, I don't listen to monkeys about the world. You know, I'm just, I don't. I have a policy. I also don't listen to chipmunks about art. I don't listen to fish about music. I don't, you know, I just, I have a policy. I don't listen to, to highly evolved primates concerning the history of the world and, the, you know, the deep metaphysical truths underpinning all of reality. It's just a little family policy that we have. And when someone makes fun of these things like that, what it does is it often just says to the Christians standing on the sidelines who are kind of like, oh, you know, maybe they're right, it just it knocks over the whole cardboard village that they've made for the film shoot. Like It just knocks the whole thing over until you're like, oh, that's actually not that solid anymore. It's actually not that solid. We're protecting the sheep in these things against the lure of inner rings and hipness and all of that. This is an inoculation against all that. It's like all the cool kids are, you know, are down with homosexuality and you say, that's gay. You just own it and you inoculate the whole flock. You say, forget about that. That's so, so effeminate, so gay, so gross. We want nothing to do with it. Do you mean the guy with stubble on his chin wearing lipstick talking in a lisp? You want me to listen to that guy? That guy is soft. That guy probably couldn't even, you know, you know if, if he came across an accident scene, he'd probably faint. He probably wouldn't be able to go in and help people get out of the burning vehicle. Look at that guy. You want me to follow him? What a sissy. Godly bullying, godly mockery. Picking fights with the kingdom of darkness. So we're, we're often attempting to draw fire in this by targeting the kingdom of darkness and what looks strong. This is, you know, Paul's talking in, in um, I think, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. He's talking about lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. And he says, we have divine power to tear down those strongholds and destroy lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. And, and you'll notice that his language doesn't say something like, we have the power to really respect and be kind about and maybe eventually, you know, rearrange the strongholds, he says we destroy them. Just not one stone left standing upon their worldview by the time you're done. Destroy them. You'll notice as well that the, the harshest words biblically are reserved for, for religious hypocrites. Uh, godly mockery is made for Pharisees of all stripes. Okay, so 
you're going to um, often see satire in the Bible directed at religious Pharisees. This can be misleading for us because it can, people can confuse this for meaning that Christian satire ought only to be directed inward. It ought only to be directed at the church and, and rot in the church. And, and I would say, yes, first it ought to be directed at rot in the church. The first place that judgment starts is where? It's with the household of God. And so if we have some big planks in our eye, how dare we go talk about you know, lady pastors in another church? If we have some huge planks in our eye, how dare we talk about the non-Christians out there? Clean your room. Jordan Peterson was right. I hope the Lord saves him. Clean your room before you tell how the, the world how it ought to run itself. Clean your room. And that means Christians ought to be repentant, uh, coming to the Lord often, keeping short accounts of sin, confessing, loving one another with godly zeal, uh, pursuing holiness, meditating on the word of God, making it our delight. Uh, those and orphans, that we ought to be doing all of those things, city set on the hill, that the, the, the world may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven according to Jesus. But then you'll notice that there are other religious Pharisees in the world. Many of them right now are marching in gay pride parades. Some of the most pharisaical religious people in the world are atheists. Some of the most pharisaical religious people in the world are LGBTQ activists, are abortion activists, are fill in the blank, race hustlers. Some of the most religious people in the world are in these other camps. And so the Christian looks in his hand and he says, well, I have a sharp sword there and there's a big full balloon. Hmm. I'm sore tempted <laughs> to skewer, to jab a few. <laughs> well, you can, you can, provided your sword is being used in truth and provided it's being used in, in the right measure and provided it's being used in a biblically informed way. The, the, the sword can cut all sorts of places. Let's just make sure it cuts us first. Make sure it cuts us up, puts us on the altar, burns us up, whole burnt offering to the Lord. That's what the priestly sword was for. So let's end. We've got five minutes before I'm gonna go to Q&A on just some, some very important words on keeping it on the straight and narrow. Because there are about 10,000 ways to do what I'm describing wrong for every one way there is to do it right. In the same way that when you're driving down the freeway in an 18-wheeler, there are 10,000 ways that you can move the steering wheel that will result in disaster, and only really one or two that will result in you staying on the road and not killing people. And all your whole car goes spilled across I-15, right? Th this is like that. Or, or, or like when you're shooting a gun, there are often 10,000 wrong places to put that bullet for every one right place to put that bullet. Right, we need to be very careful with this. And you might respond to that admission with saying something like, so why not just avoid it altogether? But once again, and I can sympathize with that response because I, I've seen with consternation countless times when Twitter warriors, keyboard warriors, have appointed themselves as the prophet Elijah and proceeded to, with great immaturity, burn down worlds and anathematize everybody other than themselves. And so by the time they're done with their satire, it's no longer godly whatsoever. They've actually just concluded that they are the only Christian in the entire world. That, and, and maybe one other guy over there, but I've got my eye on him, right? Like, with youth immaturity, with youth pride, um, you know, men are often combative and they can get just way too far and need to have restraint and self-rule. But that does not tell us that we ought to take a grinder out and grind off all the edges of the sword. No, we need to learn how to wield it. We need to learn how to wield it, not conclude that swords can hurt people and then put it in a really deep part of the basement in a, wooden, in a cardboard box somewhere and say, swords are dangerous. We're going to leave that at home. Well, I'd say, no, carry your Glock and know how to use it because you're going to need it sometimes. Not often, but if you need it, you'd better have it and know how to use it. This is what godly mockery is like. So the first thing I would say is that you ought to measure twice, cut once. So if you're going to take your sword out and swing it around, measure twice, cut once. Listen to the old woodworking adage and make sure that you evaluate the target you're about to run your sword through and make sure that you are being just in your mockery or in your conclusion. Make sure that you're telling the truth. You don't judge hearts. You don't have all knowledge. Establish criminal guilt on the basis of two or three witnesses like the Bible commands you to do. Don't just, you know, stand there on your wooden soapbox swinging your sword around 
and, and, and just hitting whoever you see passing by that you have no clue what you're talking about. Make sure that you measure twice, cut once. You've got to make sure that you accurately diagnose the issue you're speaking to. Jesus never failed in this. The examples in Scripture we have are inerrant, imperfect in this. Jesus knew the thoughts and intentions of the hearts of men. He could look and he could see. He knew what they were thinking, what they were doing. He knew their motivations. The same way. And so we have to rely on biblical wisdom, which means multiple witnesses, careful thinking, biblical thinking, not binding consciences outside of what has been spoken or is a good and necessary consequence of what has been written by the Lord. Number two, we want to be jovial warriors, not embittered complainers. There can be a fine line between a whiner and fighting the good fight. Right? It's actually easy to pretend to be doing the latter when you're actually engaged in the former. Bitter complainers are not operating with faith in the character and promises of God because if we understood those two things, if we understood God's character and his promises, we would never whine ever again. We would actually be able to obey Paul's injunction to rejoice at all times. Remember Elijah on the run. Elijah, the, 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 the perfect example in some, you know, not, Jesus is perfect. Elijah, a biblical example of godly mockery. Elijah also uh, uh, operated outside of faith in several cases. I mean, we see Elijah on the run feeling quite alone, and he's essentially whining to God in 1 Kings. God, I'm all alone. I'm the only faithful one left. And then God shows up, and what does God do to him? God does what proud people need, and he shakes him up. He sends a big earthquake. He sends all kinds of noisy stuff, and then he speaks to him in a still, small voice and tells him, no, I'm on your side. I haven't abandoned you. There's still 7,000 that haven't be uh, bent the knee to Baal. And this is a good word for us. The Lord is on our side. The Lord is faithful. In Christ, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. The Lord is not going to, he's not impotent. He's not going to leave the world without a faithful witness. His promises even say in Isaiah that upon the coming of this chosen one, who, who, the government will be on his shoulders that of the increase of his kingdom and of peace there will be no end. Meaning that from the coming of the Lord when Jesus said, if I cast out demons in the name of God by the finger of God, then the kingdom of heaven is among you. The kingdom came with the coming of Jesus. We're not awaiting it. And from that moment, what did Isaiah say would happen? Of its increase and of peace there would be no end. There, there will be times in history and places in history where, where we are on the run, where we're doing strategic withdrawals and retreats, where we're up against the wall. But the story of history is the story of the conquest of the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. It's the story of the Father putting all of the enemies of the Son under his feet until he stands up and puts down the last enemy, which is death, at his coming. I would say as well, that babbles are a waste of bricks and words. Don't build a kingdom for yourself. Uh, people who are very gifted in satire are often very proud and fall. So have godly men around you. Don't waste your words building a babble. It's just, it's just stupid. Don't build your own kingdom. Don't build your own empire. Build the kingdom of God. I would say that uh, you, you've got to have range, man, would be how I'd put this, right? If you're always abrasive, always sarcastic, always satiric, you're probably a fool, not a godly man. So use the buddy system. The best way to know how you're doing is to have honest and wise friends, seasoned mentors outside of yourself who are saying, hey, are you sure you didn't write? I, I know you're very pleased with yourself and the particular turn of phrase that you used in this argument, but are you a huge jerk? Just checking. We're just checking. Just making sure that you're not, you know, having too much fun here. <laughs> that you're still, you know, you're, you're not like uh, you, someone comes and pats you on the back and says, man, good job, the kingdom of God really scored a point today in that thing you wrote, and you said, the kingdom of God? Oh, oh yeah, the kingdom of God, right? <laughs> Be careful. Be careful. Use the buddy system. Believe your buddies. Remember that you will have to answer for every careless word. Don't forget the holy God who judges. And then finally, make sure you're building something, not just tearing something down. You're going to need to pull weeds, clear rocks, plow fields if you want to build and grow. You're going to need to occasionally light stuff on fire to make way for something better. You're occasionally going to need to go and cut down a whole lot of stuff so that something else can grow up in its place. But you need to remember that we aren't in the business of tossing Molotov cocktails and spray painting big, big red anarchist A's on neighboring buildings. We are Christians...
means is that we are builders, right? Why do you think that we're warned that unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain? It's because we really are called to build. It's really what we're doing. We really are called to disciple, to evangelize, to baptize, disciple the nations. That's our job. That's building something. It's building something that will far outlast our own lifetimes and be far more meaningful than our individual parts in the story. And so we actually need to be able to discern between mere human activity and God's work in and through his people by faith. And one of the most sure ways to pursue the, the godly version of what I just said is to pursue building the church, the kingdom of God, to build a godly house, and not just to take pot shots at the culture, not just to take pot shots at others. Are you catechizing your children? Are you praying for them? Are you teaching your kids to sing and pray and read and love the Lord and, and see him everywhere? Are you joyful? Are you bitter? These are all diagnostics that help us keep it on the straight and narrow as we pursue the godly use of things like mockery and satire. So let's go ahead and turn to questions. We've got about, you know, five or ten minutes here. And um, let's do Kent and then Michelle. Those are the first two I saw. Kent, would you mind speaking into this, if Mr. Jockler would distribute, so the recording can hear you? So we know in the scriptures that it says women aren't qualified to preach. A couple Sundays ago, you, you said that uh, men and women are made different. God uh, made us glorious in different ways. It's, I think maybe that it's not that women don't know the Bible. Uh, it's that because of their nature, their gentleness, to be a good pastor, you have to call out sin with a sword. And it looks really ugly on a woman. Could that be why God chose men to be pastors? Yeah, that's a, that's a really insightful question. Um, and I think you are getting to the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue is that God is not arbitrary in the assignment of duties. God doesn't just say, men, lead your homes and be pastors. Women, be workers at home and don't be pastors arbitrarily. God created maleness to be fit to that task and femaleness to be fit to their task. So we want women who know the Bible front to back, who love the word, who meditate day and night, who are educated well. We educate girls, boys, all the way up. We want them to read Greek and, and Latin and Hebrew, and we want them to read theology. And we, want them to be, we want them to be so able in the word that they are prepared to not be deceived by the deceitfulness of the enemy, human philosophy. Um, but you are right that it is not fitting, it's not becoming to, for a congregation to say, there are wolves coming. Jessica, go get them. That should tell you something. It would, be, it would not be fitting. Uh, hey, hey, uh, you know, someone's, someone's coming to make martyrs of the congregation. Cindy, Adam, right? And our men and women need to be prepared for martyrdom. That's, that's clear if you read the history of the early church. Men and women were both martyred. But men are to get between danger and those in their charge. That is in the nature, the essence, the grain of masculinity. So yes, you're right. One of the reasons that um, that the office of pastor is restricted to men is because God did make men to wield the sword in a different way than he did um, for, for the feminine nature. And so even things like satire, I would, I would caution women um, from being overly satiric. But this is, I think, a, a distinctly masculine um, art, though, again, there are asterisks to that, and there are going to be situations. But generally speaking, um, the teachers in the church, the pastors in the church ought to be the ones who are wielding the sword against these big demon gods to prepare the church for, for ministry. And then Michelle, I think you had a question. So mine actually goes along with that, but, um, because I felt like this was more for men. Um, how can we as women, wives, um, I would say my tendency would be to, because I'm more of a nurturer, like when, when my husband throws something out like that, the Molotov cocktail, um, I'm, I have a tendency to be like, ooh, don't, do you know what I mean? How can I be encouraging to my husband instead in ways that are biblical when he 
when he throws haymakers. The sword. Yeah. yeah I, I love that question actually because this is this really I didn't realize till that till Kent's question that this is such a masculine conversation. Um, so we need ride or die wives. Like godly men need ride or die wives. They need wives who are just going to have their husbands back. And I don't mean encourage them in sin, but there is an instinct um, that is a feminine instinct of restraint and protection. And so when men go out and do things that are going to be unrestrained seeming and draw danger, they can be, te- they can be a little, tre- have trepidation at that and say, whoa, why is my pastor, why is my husband, why, you know, why are they talking like this? Don't they realize they're going to get us in trouble? What if people are mad at them? What if people start fighting back? And we need our wives to say something like, come back with your shield or on it, right? Not... There was, oh, I wish Lexi wasn't in nursery today because she, she would know, hey, what's the, what's the story about in church history where, do you know what I'm talking about? That's right. So there was a, like some church controversy and the husband feared that if he spoke up for the side of truth that he'd be killed. And so he's talking with his wife, and his wife basically said, well, I'd rather have a dead husband than a coward. Right? Men are called to give their strength away in service of the good, as God defines it. And what that means is sometimes wives have to say, go out and be willing to die. Go out and be willing to die. Go out and be willing to be hated for the name of Christ. Um, so I would tell the ladies that to not, not just never, never, ever ask your husband, like, work, work me through how you said this, and you know, help me understand if this was godly or not. Not to say, hey, um, my, me Lord, back to the first class, I would encourage you to go talk to the pastors. Maybe talk to the pastors about this thing you said um, and, and, and ask for their advice or their counsel in this conversation that you're having. But I'm for you, I'm behind you, I love you. Come back with your shield or on it. We're out of time. Sorry, guys. <laughs>